Welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. This is a space we've created to explore the components of diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and let Leverage commonalities. Let's do away with political correctness. Explore ideation. Build community and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast. And this is Bertine Crevacore West. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. My name is Bertine Crevacore West, and I'm delighted to be your host. Today, I am especially delighted to bring with you our special guest, Mr. Alonzo Kelly. Alonzo, welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. Super excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And so I'm going to tell our listeners a little bit about you. So Alonzo is a dynamic executive coach, professor, three-time best-selling author, and radio host. He's gained international and global attention as a premier consultant and strategist. Alonzo is recognized as one of the nation's leading experts on leadership development, strategic thinking, planning, and acting, which results in individual and organizational goal achievement. He's appeared on America's Premier Experts, which airs on major networks across the country, including ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox. Alonzo has served over 1,000 individuals through personal and professional development, delivering training to a plethora of Fortune 500 companies, colleges and universities, institutions of higher learning, foreign countries such as the Netherlands, Belgium, and Canada, nonprofit organizations, and is consistently retained to be the keynote speaker at large and small events across the country. He holds a bachelor's degree in accounting, three master's degrees, public administration, human resource, and labor relations and business administration, and is nearing completion of a PhD in multidisciplinary human services. He is also currently in the process of obtaining his doctorate in business administration and currently serves as the state board of directors for the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, and the national board of directors for SANG, supporting emotional needs of the gifted. Alonzo, Welcome, welcome to the Global Fluency <laughs> Podcast. You make me sound pretty cool, so I might actually see what you charge to go on the road. Thank you oh for my that. <laughs> I'm here for it. I'm here for it. I am just, honestly, I am, as I was saying to you off air, a part of the reason why I have this podcast um, and why it's it's such a fun um, experience for me is that I get to meet such wonderful and esteemed people as yourself who are really um doing, walking the walk, if I should say it. Yeah. And so, and a part of that too, is that this is educational for me as well as for our listeners. So I thank you for the work that you do. And I'm kind of staggered over, you know, the multiple master's degrees. So (laughs) I commend you on that. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh. So Alonzo, let's just dive into it. Yeah. Tell us a bit about your professional background, your training and your company. Yep. So honored to meet everyone. Thank you for taking the time to share your time. To to work backwards, I've been doing this, which I have intentionally not labeled for about 11 years. Um, I I just tell people I'm, I'm blessed to be able to be paid to get to think out loud. Prior to that, I was senior vice president, head of shared services, for Wells Fargo Funds Management Group. So I was in the mutual fund business uh, for a few years. And then prior to that, I ran seven outpatient subspecialties for Children's Hospital of Wisconsin. So I was in pediatric healthcare. So that's a little bit about my background. And as a foreshadow, the, the lens I have in terms of how I engage this topic of diversity. Wow. I love that you mentioned um, pediatric health care because I always find it fascinating um, where everyone started and what propelled them to do the work that they currently do. 
Yeah. So, yeah. so tell me this, and then let's talk about your experiences, which I am sure are vast um, within the diversity and inclusion journey. How do you, how do you, I don't even want to say stumble into it because I feel like it stumbles into us, right? Um, right. Because we're all a part of that journey, but how did it particularly stumble into you? Well, the way that I show up on this topic is I'm a big fan of critical thinking. And one of the key tenets in critical thinking is understanding the definition of a word and the concept of a word are not always the same. And most of us live our lives according to the concept. So when somebody says to me, diversity, inclusion, and equity, in my head, I believe I know what that means. Um, where a person might find themselves in a spirited debate with me is if they're arguing from their understanding rather than just accepting, I see it the way I see it and you see it the way that you see it. So the, the angle that I come at this is in my head, whenever someone asks me a question of diversity, I replace it with the word belonging. Like, what is my experience with belonging wherever it is I am? Um, because I'm more than black man. Mm -hmm. And so um, for me and my journey and how I approach this is, you know, which is not unique to me. I have, from a very early age, often found myself being the only one. Mm -hmm. So I went to high school. Um, I left Detroit. I'm from Detroit, Michigan. Um, I left Detroit at 13 to attend an all boys boarding seminary to become a Catholic priest. So wow. how many black Catholic priests do you know? First of all, right? Can I um, tell you, Alonzo, I've only <laughs> met one in my life and I'm Catholic as well. And I was so just awestruck when I met yep. him because I'd never seen somebody that looked like me in that position. And I won't even pretend that his service wasn't always amazing. <laughs> so, so it was, right. it was a double blessing. So, wow, that's another layer yeah. of complexity, which I think is fantastic. Yep. That is also unexpected. So what happens, um, the word for that, you know, we know is, is cognitive dissonance, right? Like mm -hmm. you're so caught off guard by it that you have to remind yourself there's no reason we can't be there either. Exactly. But we just don't see it. So when you see it, you're like, wait, what? So as you can imagine, like I was the only one in that experience. I can tell you today I'm not a priest. Mm -hmm. But then I ended up with a basketball scholarship at a liberal arts college where I was the only black guy on campus for a while. Oh so, my now, so now that happens. Uh -huh. And then my first job out of college, I work for in a, Jew, in a criminal, not criminal justice, juvenile corrections program. And I'm the only one there. And then I leave there. And then I go to, to the pediatric side in healthcare where I'm the only black um, ambulatory care manager. Then I go to Wells Fargo and I'm the only black senior vice president. So mm -hmm. it's important for context. The way that I come at this is, again, back to the word belonging and, and where do I feel like I belong? What did it take for me to feel like I belong? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how I present on this topic. Wow, that, that's honestly a fascinating interpretation of the word. Um, you remind me when you're mentioning the words belonging of um, my friend and colleague, Don Christian, who has a movement surrounding belonging. And prior to my speaking with her, um, I had never even considered that concept. It's at least not intellectually, but in, emotionally, you know that that's what you're seeking, right? right? I love that you're making the distinction between the definition and the concept. Right. It's interesting. It's a lot of fun when you ask people to engage in a conversation, but the rule is they cannot Google and they cannot pull out a dictionary mm -hmm. and just watch what happens, right? So that's the angle I come at it. And when I feel like when I reframe it to belonging, then it's beyond race. Um, what about being a male? What about being a person from a central city in a rural environment? What about being 6'3", athletically built in a community where the only people who look like you are professional athletes? Mm -hmm. so, so that's the only thing they see. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my gosh. And and that again um, goes back to something we were talking about off air with the different yep. components of diversity, right? right. Um, race is a huge component, but there's so many more things. And I think that lends itself to, you know, the, uh, the concept that we are more than 
just what you see. Right. And we are what you see. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> it's a bull fan. <laughs> exactly. Like I am who you think I am, but not only what you think I am, right? I mean, right. If that doesn't sound confusing enough. So that's for you right. listeners out there. If it wasn't a hard <laughs> enough topic, um, here we are making it even more complex. Or at least here I am. You broke it right. down very, very eloquently for our listeners. That's so right. then I want to talk to you about negrescence. Now, quite honestly, I had never heard of this term prior to meeting you. And so, but, and by meeting you, I mean um, for our listeners that, that follow us, um, we were planning to have the Global Fluency Summit for 2020. And you are one of our esteemed speakers that I'm so excited um, to have present to our group and our audience. Um, and so, of course, with the onset of COVID-19, we've had to postpone that until October 2020. But once I saw your topic, I really wanted to learn so much more about it and share it with our audience. So can you tell me what is Negrescence Theory? What is that all about? Love it. So let's start with the, the literal definition of the word nigrescence. Oh, I'm um, saying it wrong. Nigrescence. Pardon yeah. me. No, nope, it's you. okay. You know, this, is a lear- this is a learning podcast. Yes, so, it is. <laughs> and, and you know what? For all I know, I'm not saying it right. So we can, <laughs> so we can both be right. How about okay, that? Okay, I'll take uh, it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the, the definition of nigrescence, for those who may not be looking at it, N-I-G-R-E-S. S C E N C E. The definition of nigrescence is to return to the state of black. So, with your imagination, I want you to imagine that you're holding a cup of pure black paint and you set that cup down, and somebody comes along and pours like a little teaspoon of white paint in it. It's at that point that I hope we can agree that what's in that cup is no longer pure black. Mm-hmm. So, so in a chemistry lab, what you could do is you could put a cover on it and you could spin that cup super fast and it would separate the white from the black. And that, and that process is called nigressing or nigression. So in 1971, Dr. William Cross introduced us to the nigrescence theory. And, and what he asked to, to make it as simple as I can is, can people nigress? Wow. Okay. Can a person pull out what has been poured into them so that they return to the state of, you know, what we call black? Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm so fascinated by the theory and through my own personal experience, it's easiest for me to explain is because I feel like it's my story Mm -hmm. related to belonging. So um, my style is visual. So I'm going to paint a picture for you. So I grew up in Central City, Detroit, Michigan, um, predominantly all black. And so we'll just say for simplest terms that my first 13, you know, my years were the black experience. Mm -hmm. But I was pulled out of the Detroit public school system and put into an all white Polish speaking elementary school for eight years. Wow. So now we're back to that cup, right? So (laughs) we take the little black kid and pour some eight years of Polish in it. Now that's who I am. And then, you know, I go to the seminary and there's a little more paint. And then I go be the only black person on campus and there's some more paint. But what happens is whenever I get back home, I am no longer welcomed the way that I left originally. Mm -hmm. So it's like people will ask, you know, what happened to you? Why do you talk like that? Why do you dress like that? And so where Dr. Cross comes in is when a person feels, and I'll use me for example, feels like I've lost both base and place, and I choose to want to be accepted by my community, my Black community, what it's going to require is for me to digress. And the question becomes, can I do that? Oh, wow. You just took me through my entire <laughs> high school, college experience. Um, and, and I dare say, um, even beyond that, quite honestly. Yep. Um, so thank you for painting that visual picture. And so it seems that not only is this word a noun, but it is a verb as well. <laughs> and so I, that adds another layer of complexity. But you touched upon something that, that I want to go back to really quickly. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned things being poured into, right? Right. People being poured into. So tell me just um, with regard to being poured into, if something is being poured into us, how then 
with regards to blackness do we pour it out right because that is i would think a process that would take a lifetime now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor westbridge solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity inclusion cultural competence and soft skills trainings Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in person and online, live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, government organizations, healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, please feel free to visit their website at www.westgrouptraining.com or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. Well, that's that's the beauty of this entire topic Mm -hmm. because you will have a lot of people believe that you can And you have a lot of people believe that you can't. And so for me, just at its simplest term, if I spent eight years in an all white school speaking Polish, how do I pull that out of me? Right. I mean, how how can you? And so the way that the theory works is there's a term I left out and it's called prolonged period of time. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if we step out of this for a second, a person who jumps in a swimming pool, um, we can agree got wet. And whether they wanted to fight it or not, you are surrounded by an environment. And as a result of being in that environment, there is something that happens to you. Mm. And the longer you're in that pool, the more things will happen to you. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Yes, indeed. But life is not a pool. You can get out the pool and you can dry off and you'll stop being wrinkly, but you'll be ashy. (laughs) (laughs) At least for some of us. I will throw my hat into that ring. (laughs) Right, right. And so this isn't like that, though. And so what he looked at in the theory is, again, prolonged period of time. If you spend 13 years in one environment and 30 in another How long does it take to pull the 30 out? And will you ever do that? So I'm sure people listening to this Mm -hmm. would catch a dialect. Mm. Well, I've been surrounded by a particular community for like 40 years, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 35 years. So I talk the way I talk. Right. And if people say you talk white, well, how do I pull that out? Right. (laughs) And, you know, that resonates deeply with me because um, I've been told... I can't even begin to count um, how many times throughout my life that I don't sound the way I look. Right. And then that lends me to ask, well, what did you think I looked like? I want people to claim their thoughts, right? And to claim right. it in front of me out loud. So they hear themselves. Um, and so usually I, I get told that I look like um, a petite well, they assume by my voice that I'm a petite, blonde, blue-eyed white woman, and my name is a French name because my family is from Haiti. And so they assume a certain thing about me until they meet me, and then you can right. always tell. Um, and this is um, white people, black people, everyone in between. Um, yeah. I've had this experience, and, and then I'm a New Yorker, and then I'm told that I don't sound like a New Yorker, and I'm like, why? Because I don't say hot dog. Like I, that's not <laughs> my. That's not how I say it. I say hot dog, and I'll and I'll just, you know, I'm comfortable in my skin enough to know that that is something that is going to happen. And you know, the way I reacted to that young when I was younger was one way, and now as an adult, I I react to it very differently right. because I did have to think about, you know, who do I want to be? Because I think that's something one does with intentionality, right? Especially as you get older. And so am I willing to compromise this part of who I am um, to please other people? Do I want to? Do I need to? Because those two things are also very different. And so don't get me down this road to high school and college. (laughs) Because I will go on. Well, here's, here's what's powerful to me about the theory the longer you think about it, mm-hmm. it's not always black and white. 
it can be black, black too. Yes. So if I, as a black man, go to New York and hang out with my black brothers and sisters, somebody will go, you're not from here, are you? Wow. Right? And then I go to an all-black community in Idaho, assuming they have one, then Mm -hmm. they'll go, you're not from here, are you? Mm -hmm. So now we're back to belonging. Just because you look like does not mean you still will never ask the question, do I belong here? Mm -hmm. And that's where diversity comes in. So that's why it's all-encompassing. It is holistic. It is beyond surface. And nigrescence theory is the way that I ease into it almost like a a pediatrician giving a kid a flu shot. You make them laugh a little bit, you distract them, and then you hit them real hard, like boom, and then you make them laugh again. (laughs) Absolutely, shock and awe. So so that's what nigrescence theory is. I'm going to get people to laugh, and we laugh, and and then you hit them real hard, and then they go, ooh. Yeah. But then they think about it again, like, yeah, yep. Yep. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I feel like that's just what happened to me just now. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that was definitely a pediatrician visit right there. <laughs> oh my gosh. So then tell me this, like what role does that play? And I'm almost hesitant to ask this question because when I was, when I was thinking about the questions to ask you, um, I'm, of, I'm a firm believer that the black experience is not monolithic, but I do believe that there's some part of the Black experience that we all have in common. And that might change, you know, with the day, with the moment. But so I'm saying this question with that in mind, right? I'm asking this question with that in mind. So what part of nigrescence um, do you, what role does it play in the Black experience overall? And then in the American experience at large? Yeah, so as, as people look up the theory, what they're going to find as it relates to steps is they say that there's a, a pre-encounter, an encounter, and then immersion, immersion, commitment, and then you kind of live your life that way. And so where nigrescence comes in is um, at some point as a baby, we're not, we're not thinking about am I black or not? Like, what does that mean? But then what happens is you have an encounter and somebody points out you're black. Mm-hmm. And and from there, you're either going to immerse yourself in their definition or pull yourself out of it. And that's where nigrescence comes in. Mm-hmm. Um, and the part I think we all share an experience in is um, without our permission, it will be pointed out. Yes, yes, and, indeed. And so we're going to have to make a decision. Am I going to immerse myself in what has been applied to me by another person's experience? Or am I going to immerse myself from it and point out that, I, that I'm different? But me being different might make them uncomfortable, which leads down a whole new path. But that's where it kicks in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if somebody sees me, if somebody sees me and thinks it's okay to engage with me in a way that is otherwise disrespectful, mm. um, I might wonder, I am so removed from the black experience that they don't see me as that. So now I got to pull you out of me. Mm -hmm. I have to pull out my experience with you that whatever made you feel like that joke was okay. Wow. I feel like we, we go through that. Right. Constantly, just constantly. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's honestly an assault on the senses. That's how I would describe it. And it's not, one that somebody does intentionally, I think most of the time, but it's an assault on the person all the same. Right. Mm. And sometimes there, I like to say funny till it's not funny. Yes. Um, <laughs> it, it, it is funny till it's not funny. So right now the sun is out and mm-hmm. people can play their music with their windows down. Mm-hmm. And um, I thoroughly enjoy rap and hip hop. Mm-hmm. Remember, I live in an all-white community, right. and the community I live in also enjoys rap and hip-hop. Mm-hmm. If you are conscious enough to turn the music down when you see me, it says to me, you are very aware that some words are about to come flying out of that song that you do oh. not want to have a reaction from me about. Yeah. So if you're conscious enough to know to turn the music down, you're conscious enough to engage this other stuff. Mm. You don't get to pick and choose. Like it doesn't work. It, so it's like funny till it's not funny. So for me, I'm like, you're better off letting it ride than turning it down. Right. And I <laughs> love that because I think that 
is me telling someone through your words, that's me telling someone without saying anything, like, I want you to be your authentic self because then you can have an authentic relationship. Right. So don't sugarcoat it by turning it down. And then when I walk away, turn it back up or don't say a word you wouldn't say right. if I weren't here, you know, like say what you mean and then we can have real talk. Right. So here, so here's the crazy part. Mm-hmm. I love, I love Tupac too. And mm-hmm. if you had let it ride, I would have probably wrapped along on the corner. There it is. <laughs> there but, it you, is. but you turned it down. Mm-hmm. So now you lost me. Right. Now we can't talk about Tupac because you did that. <laughs> and, and, and now what I've done, whether it's true or not, is I'm wondering what conversations are you having when I'm not around? Yeah. Yeah. That's that. And that to me is the part that keeps people up. Right. right. Like, right. because if you're my friend, if we can ride together, then <laughs> why can't we have this conversation? Right. Yeah. And I have to say my experience is similar to yours, but differs in the fact that I went to a high school um, that I went to a junior high school that was predominantly black. And then I went to a high school that was predominantly white and Asian, specifically Korean. And then I went to a college that was Catholic, but predominantly white and Korean because most of us went to the same high school. And there are a couple sprinkles of my cousins. (laughs) So So, so you got poured into a whole lot of ways. (laughs) The first club I ever joined in college was the Filipino club. And it was because they were accepting of me, they were kind, and they were cool. And so that was my... That was my first um, college club. And, and honestly, I won't even pretend it was the most fun one that I was in because everybody was themselves. But then I found that when I was going through school that for the Black Americans, right, for African Americans, I wasn't Black enough. And so from my perspective, my, my parents yep. and I were from Haiti, I was raised to be Haitian. So I was raised as who I authentically am ethnically not racially. So ethnically, we weren't African-American. We were Haitian-American. So with that came, you know, speaking different languages at home, eating different kinds of food. And then when we would go, and honestly, having a a whole set of other complex rules in addition to the regular (laughs) rules that you have, having um, different social and cultural rules. And so, you know, I found that, you know, people would do and say things who looked like me that were very different from me. And I was chastised for that, you know, and one person even said to me, I'm going to show you how to be black. And here I am thinking, you know, I come from the first free black republic in the Western hemisphere. What are you talking about? Right. Right. And so one is then, you know, you can't even go to your parents about that because that's not their reality. They didn't come from here. So I was left to my own devices to figure that out. Right. Like, as you said, how much of that am I willing to pour out and how much of of that am I willing to keep in? And that was a struggle for some time. How do you claim your ethnicity while not, you know, denying your race, but those who look like you are saying that you're not enough. Like if, if you even can. And so I'll give another funny till it's not funny thing and be all inclusive in this topic of nigrescence. You ever notice how people say a word twice as if saying it twice is a whole new degree of it? You know, like the food was good, but it wasn't like good, good. Right, right. Or well, it's like right, hot, but it right, wasn't right. like hot, hot. Well, mm-hmm. funny till it's not funny. Mm-hmm. I mean, he black, but he ain't black, black. Yes. Well, what, is, what does that even mean? And who owns the definition? And, and to take this theory across multiple platforms, you can hear people say like, you know, she's pregnant, but she's not like pregnant, pregnant. Right. And, 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 where, and where I get very uncomfortable is I don't know where your line is. So right. like, I mean, I was drunk, but wasn't like drunk, drunk. Or, you know, he's gay, but not like gay, gay. Or she's black, but not like black, black. And right. then for the individual as it relates to belonging, well, what is black, black? Mm-hmm. And where is that standard? Exactly. <laughs> so that, Because that changes with the person who's making the statement, right? right. Um, my grandmother, for instance, she, was, she looked very different um, from me, 
even though we have the same physical shape, um, which she always likes to take credit for, but <laughs> she looks very different from me physically though. Um, her hair was straight, her skin was more fair than mine, you know, so, and my parents even, um, my father was more fair than my mother. And so, but that, that to me is for somebody, and I'm kind of in the middle, right? I'm, I'm just, I'm, I always say I'm just me, but <laughs> that's not a good description enough for people sometimes. But um, with that, with being black enough, right? With being right. black and black, black, when I, when I was back here in the United States, because I was born here, but I left when I was two months old, came back when I was two and a half and didn't start school um, in America until I was five. Because in Haiti, you go to school for a longer time, you start earlier, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I was always confused by that. I was like, well, what's black, black? Because does that mean how I look or how I act or right. both? And who's got the rule book? And why do I have to follow the rule, you know? So that is so confusing because it, it all depends on somebody else's perspective that really has nothing to do with you, but you're right. affected by it. Yeah, and it's, and it's very real, and it leads to a lot of internalization on who am I and, and where do I belong. And, you know, I, I picked on Idaho before it's because I do know somebody there and, and what makes me blacker than him or right. him blacker than me, or even like diversity of thought, right? And so, mm -hmm. I, you know, I say all the time, I'm here for your growth, not your comfort. And so I won't say how I vote or who I vote for or whatever, but I am dismayed sometimes by my community. Based on how you view the world, somebody will not consider you black, black. And so only because like, I know the, it's super cool, the Supreme Court hearings are on audio now. Yes, which is so, so I hear Clarence Thomas talking. Hmm. Well, he gets accused, I mean, he black, but he ain't black, black. Why? Right. Because of his political ideology? Like, mm -hmm. where, where's the rule on that? Mm -hmm. And it, it just goes on and on and on. And so somewhere there's a memo that I didn't get. Most on of the, us did. On the rules. <laughs> <laughs> on the rules. And, you know, if you play this instrument or listen to this music or go to this school or speak mm -hmm. this language or think this way then something about your, your blackness is questioned. And that's where, in fairness to people who are not black, we are the root of our own confusion. I couldn't agree with you more on that. And, and you were mentioning music earlier and you liking hip hop and rap. Mm -hmm. and, and I will tell you this, um, I know I thoroughly confused my parents uh, because I played the violin, uh, classical violin for five years, but I also loved heavy metal music. And so they were walking around like, all right, this is what she does, right? And but then my friends couldn't understand that. And and I love rap and hip hop, but not to the extent that I love the other two musical right. genres, right? And so I always was confused as to why must I choose? Right. right? Because that would that would denote whether I was black enough, I suppose. And even um, outside of them, when I would go to, I remember just a few years ago, I went to a concert with my husband and he knew I liked metal music because a friend was having a party and it was a cover band of ACDC. And I knew the words and I was singing along. And what I realized was that people were staring at me, um, a few of the guys there, because I think there were very few of us women actually singing along, but I was the only one that looked like me. And so I just looked over and I was like, all right, well, it is what it is. If you don't know the words, have a seat, <laughs> you know? And my husband, he was, he was thoroughly confused because he, he listens to almost 100% reggae and then um, some Latin music here and there. And so he was just like, I didn't know you knew all the words. And I was like, well, that's okay, <laughs> right? And so for us, that was just a fun thing. But I know for the people around me, they were confused. Yeah, that's and, cognitive dissonance right there. Yeah. They're like, wait, it. what? I have to laugh because <laughs> what you're reminding me of in my head mm -hmm. is, when, you know, when the gyms were open, I look around the gym and everybody with their headphones on and sometimes you can hear their music. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the gym is a drug dealing gangster rapper, except right. in, in my headphones, I'm listening to like Zach Brown band and Chris Stapleton. Like it's just, it's so hilarious. 
<laughs> we would all be surprised. <laughs> yeah, that's just it. And that's why I really love the conversations because even within the Black race, we're discovering new things about not only each other, but ourselves. And I think in that sense, we're expanding that black black line right yep, yep. um you can get the memo but we'll be expanding it <laughs> because it right. needs to be. but then let's move on to our next question yeah. so i always say this and feel free to disagree but i always say um political correctness is the enemy of cultural competence and i say that because if i even use nationality and race as an example and ethnicity people always would refer to me as african-american and so I would, I would correct them and say, I'm actually Haitian American. Um, I'm Latin American, I'm Caribbean American. I'm not African American because that's a different ethnicity, just like being Irish and Italian are two different ethnicities. One's neither good or bad and neither is the other, but they're just different. So by me acknowledging that, I'm honoring my parents and their culture and their history, which is my culture and history, right? And so I've gotten so much pushback um, especially from Black people, African Americans in particular, about that. And one thing that happened to me in college, and we were preparing for some kind of exam, and it was 300 people taking this exam, and a dean that I respected very much, um, she was a young African American dean, and she was so cool. And she was one of those that would invite the students to her home. And so at the time, um, St. John's University, they didn't have a box that matched who I was. And so I went down to her and I said to her, Dean such and such, um, I don't see my category here. And she looked at me and gave me an up down and I was confused by that. And then she said to me, you don't know what race you are? And I said, no, that's not what I said. I said that I don't <laughs> see my designation here. And she said, so put what you think you fit into. And as I turned, I wasn't pleased with that response, but that was a lesson for me. But as I turned and started walking back, she bent down and said into the microphone out loud for everyone here, if you don't know what race you are, leave it blank. So of course, 299 pair of eyes are looking straight at me, a very obvious black woman, right? And I just thought to myself, that's the last time I'm ever going to ask somebody to define myself for myself. Yep. It's like, and the thing is, she was so awesome and cool. And that's what made the disappointment even more profound. And now I can't remember her name, which says a lot. <laughs> but <laughs> that to me was one of those things where, without me going too much off on a tangent, was why political correctness, that shadowed her view of who I was, right? It obscured her view. So I always say, you know, political correctness, it gets in the way of cultural competence. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I have yet to understand the term mm -hmm. political correctness because in terms of my understanding of the concept, everybody hates politics. So I'm not sure how it's correct in any way, shape or form. So, <laughs> um, so to the question, how do I feel political correctness has impacted my work in industry? I, I feel like, um, what do they say about the Supreme Court that they make decisions not on the weather, but the climate? Mm, yes. So, the climate we're in now has added further confusion to what it means to be politically correct. Mm. So the climate we're in now, just as, a, uh, as an explicit example, I honestly have never seen more Confederate flags in my life. It, does, it doesn't mean that they didn't exist. Mm -hmm. I just don't know that the climate allowed for people to prominently display them in all parts of the country. Alonzo, you're going to stop peeking into my head for a moment. <laughs> I was having this conversation yesterday with a friend of mine, and I said to her, you know, um, with, with what we're, this evolution that we're going through right now with COVID-19 and, and self-quarantining and all of that, I said to her, you know, these protests that are going on with people um, you know, bombarding, I forget which state it was. I don't know if it was Michigan, but bombarding the state capitol. Yeah, you know. Michigan, Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah, right? And so with them doing that, um, 
I was confused. I was like, why did they need, you know, machine guns and Confederate flags? What does that have to do with their desire um, to go back to work? And, and that to me... I got nothing. <laughs> right? Right? I was trying I to find know. some intellectual, kind of empathetic understanding just for my own sake. And I could not. I could not. And it's rare yeah. for me when I can't find something um, that makes sense to me where I can say, let me at least, I don't need to agree with them, but let me see where they're coming from. Let me try to understand their perspective. And there was nothing that I could say to justify what they were doing or to even understand it for myself. So I think you're very right in that sense. And it, it just doesn't make sense to me that we're seeing so many of these things right now because um, they've existed before, yeah. right? Your Second Amendment rights were what they were before. Your, you know, your desire to fly a flag um, that you choose, that that was there before. But yeah. now it's just, it's so omnipresent that I'm just like, what has given people this kind of permission, this kind of freedom to just do this so openly, so brazenly? Well, and that's that's where I challenge people. Um, if they can, to separate how they feel from what it is we say we want. So I don't, I personally do not believe we are any more racist today as a people than we were three years ago. Right. What the climate changed though, that people are more comfortable letting you know. Mm. Like they didn't just wake, we, we're the ones who say people aren't born like that. So then you can't believe three years ago, people woke up like that. That's true. That's so, true. but the, the climate allows for me to share with you how I feel and to exercise the rights I've always had, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, right? I just didn't feel comfortable doing it. Well, mm -hmm. now I do. So if I can separate the emotion from it, I'm like, yeah, okay. The, the climate changed. Mm -hmm. Not the weather, the climate. <laughs> wow, I'm going to borrow that from you. So, just so you know. Well, I borrowed it from the Supreme Court, so there you go. <laughs> so we're borrowing it from them. All right, then. So, Alonzo, I want to ask you, then, what are the two things that you'd like to impart upon our listeners before we conclude our conversation that I can honestly say I can have with you for a good couple of hours? <laughs> but <laughs> what would you oh. like the takeaway for people to have, especially with regard to nigrescence? Yeah, the first is have an honest conversation about what it takes for you to feel like you belong. What does that mean for you? Before you impose it on me and what you think I need, what does it mean for you? And then nigrescence as it relates to returning to the state of Black, I would reframe it to returning to the state of comfort. Oh, wow. Okay. There's some cognitive dissonance. Yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. That is great. So Alonzo, tell our listeners where they can find you, where they can follow you, and where they can get in touch with you. Uh, thank you for that. So my website is simple, alonzokelly.com, K-E-L-L-Y. LinkedIn is under my name and under Facebook. Um, if you look up, if, first of all, if you look my name up, you're going to see a big note that says, I do not believe it's possible for me to have the capacity to have a thousand friends. So I don't post on there anymore. It, <laughs> it will redirect you to my business page, which is Kelly Leadership Group. And I'd be humbled for you to join me there. And then on YouTube, you can also look up Kelly Leadership Group. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you. Thank you for being on our show, for helping educate us all on nigrescence and, and having just this wonderful conversation that I am truly hoping um, after people listen to this episode that they will have, you know, virtual water cooler conversations. <laughs> Um, hopefully we'll all have more of those in person ones sooner rather than later, but yes, we will. I want us to continue this conversation once this episode is over. And I want our listeners out there to send us their questions, send Alonzo your questions, you know, um, because this is a great conversation starter and we're looking forward to seeing you at the 2020 Global Fluency Summit, Alonzo, in October. So everybody's- I'll be there. <laughs> 
Alonzo will be there. So come on out for that. Come on out for that. So my name is once again, Bertine Crevacor West, and I am delighted to be your host for the Global Fluency Podcast. Alonzo Kelly, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank for you. Getting in today's interview. Thank you. Everybody be safe out there. And as always here at the Global Fluency Podcast, you can find us um, by following us on social media. We are on Facebook and send us your questions, send us your comments. Remember, this is your podcast. You can also find us on YouTube for our closed captioning because we want everyone to participate um, in this interview and all of our interviews. So let's keep the conversation going. I'm Bertine Crevercore West and until next time, we will talk to you then. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions, LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences. Leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going, going, going.